First day on the job. This Mr. Larson is supposed to be the best. I only hope I picked up on this large format business. Good morning. Jim, boy, am I glad to see you. Listen, I got people waiting in that office, and we've got to get started on the Sonics Corporation annual report shot. Now, I know this is your first day on the job, but see if you can set up the camera for me. It's a simple, straight-on shot of that speaker, and you're going to find a new 4x5 camera in that box, and the lens should be right next to it. But... Oh, great. Now what do I do? Assembling a large format view camera isn't all that hard, you know. Oh, great. Now I'm hearing voices. Want some help? Well, I sure don't know what's going on. But if you can get me going, more power to you. Starting is easy and fun. For all your experience with 35 millimeter and medium format cameras, you've got a whole new world waiting for you with a large format. There's so much more you can do. I know, that's why I'm here. Hey, do you want my help? Okay, okay, where do we begin? We begin with the basic parts of the large format view camera. Front standard, rear standard, and bellows. All of which are attached to the monorail already. Lift them out of the box. I think I can handle this, all right. Now, mount the camera on the studio stand. Relax, will you? All right, all ready. Now turn the standards. Those U-shaped pieces attached to the monorail, perpendicular to the rail. No, no, that's backwards. The end with the ground glass is the back standard. Good. Next, they've got the ground glass viewing screen on the inside of the rear standard for shipping purposes. Use the slide lock to free it. And then clip it into the back of the standard where it belongs. And while you're attaching that ground glass, take a look at the size. That's the size of the film you'll be working with now, four by five inches. That's why they call it the large format. Quite a difference in size from the 35 millimeter negative you're used to working with, isn't it? Larger image size means better image quality. And that's one of the reasons the boss is using a view camera for this job. Pick up the bellows. Release the locks on both front and rear standards and attach the bellows front and rear. The bellows are flexible, as anyone can see. That's so you maintain light integrity and still can move the standards further apart for focusing or to use different focal length lenses. This camera has focusing knobs on both standards. One side for focusing. One side to lock. Boy, even I could handle this. Missing anything? Sure, unless this camera works without a lens. This is a 210 lens. 210 millimeters, and what else? Hey, everything's built in. Right. A view camera lens includes the diaphragm, shutter mechanism, flash connections, and most have a press focus lever to keep the shutter open while focusing. The 210 millimeter is the most popular lens for 4x5 cameras. What about other lenses? Not too fast. First put the lens board on the front standard. Now walk around to the back of the camera. And on the way, pick up the focusing cloth and the bracket that supports it. Slip the bracket into its sockets. Put the focusing cloth on the wire. And then put your head under the cloth and look at the ground glass. Hey, just like Ansel Adams. Just look at the ground glass. You'll see another reason why large format view cameras are so special. No little peephole there. Let me make it easy for you. This camera already is positioned, image size included. For fine focus, use the focusing loop. Move the standard back and forth with the focus knob until you get the sharpest image. Looks great. And I could use the grid to make sure of the alignment. But I don't know if I can live with the image upside down. And it's reversed from side to side too, right? That's right. This camera also is equipped with a Fresnel lens and an extra bright focusing screen, so you're looking at a really bright image. As for the image reversal, you'll get used to it in time. Ready for more? Fire away. Now drop in a 300 millimeter long lens for a bigger image and flatter perspective than the normal lens. Hey, that's pretty good. Now try a 90 millimeter wide angle. 
You might have to use a bag bellows with this one to get the lens closer to the ground glass. Speaking of which, which lens do you think the boss wants to use? The 210, absolutely. Mr. Larson ought to be happy with this. Took you a while, though, didn't it? And you know something? You're going to get a better picture out of it. The larger format is a big help. And it forces you into a type of discipline that makes you get everything right before you press that shutter release. Slower operation and more planning means better discipline. But there must be more. Oh, there's more. Well, they've gone. Let's see how you've done so far here. I'll tell you what, I'll check the camera in the shot. You go on ahead to the dark room and start loading film in the holders for me, all right? Okay, I'll be right back. Okay. Don't panic now. This operation is purely mechanical. We're dealing with a 4x5 format here and sheet film that goes into those holders. Cleaning the holder is essential. First, take out the slides. Then open the flaps at the bottom. Now tap the edge of the holder with that anti-static brush to dislodge any stuck dirt particles or bits of film. Brush out the entire interior. And the dark slide. Next, insert the slides just a little so you don't have to feel around for them in the dark. And remember, white side, the notched side up. That tells you the film has not been exposed. And from now on, you're in the dark so you don't expose the film. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. Open the film box. You're working with a top, a bottom, and a second lid that makes a light, tight container. The film is sealed in a foil envelope. Open the envelope from one end and take out the film. Feel for the notched corner on the film and turn the film until the notches are in the upper right-hand corner. This places the emulsion side up. Use your left thumb and forefinger to guide the edge of the film into the grooves on each side of the holder. Film in now? Got it. Slip a fingernail under the end of the film and lift to see if it really is in the grooves. It's in. Close the flap then and push the slides in all the way. That keeps the film light tight and locks it in place. Make sure the white side is up. Remember, it's notched. White side out, white side out, white side out, white side out. So, did you uh, clean the holders? Absolutely. Good. I checked the setup, set the exposure, leveled the camera, stopped down the aperture. You're right on the money. Now let's do a Polaroid test for exposure and composition. Now, this is the place you can destroy all your work if you're not careful. Remember, camera movement can destroy the shot. So make sure everything is locked down tight before you insert the holder. Now, let me show you the right way to open the back so you don't move the camera. Use your thumb and forefinger to spread the back. And then slide the holder in gently. Make sure the holder seats properly. Check to make sure the shutter is closed. Remove the slide, and you're ready to go. And we'll take our Polaroid here. Now, while we're waiting for this, you go ahead and put this film holder in there, okay? Good. Well, that ought to be about 20 seconds. Let's see how you've done here. And what do we have? Hey, good exposure, composition, good light, looking good. All right. 
Well, Jim, let's take this picture for real here. There we go. You want to put that slide back in? Black side out. Jim, uh, I'm going to have you start working with the camera on this final shot, all right? Okay. Okay, I'm going to go get the speaker for the shot, and you bracket a few exposures. Sounds good. Now, this puts us into a different ball game, my friend. Let's begin by picking out the proper focal length lens. And that's a function of perspective, image size desired, and the covering power of the lens. What we're talking about here is choosing a lens. And the lens is the single most important part of the view camera. Begin with perspective, the size relationship between objects, which varies according to how far away they are from each other. In this case, how far apart the speaker cabinets are from each other. Remember, the closer, the larger. The further away, the smaller. The closer you move the camera to the speaker cabinets, the larger the front speaker, and the smaller the rear speaker. Let's say we don't like that perspective. We want to make the rear speaker look closer to and nearly as large as the front speaker. If we move back, both speakers will decrease in size, but the front speaker shrinks more rapidly and the two speakers now appear closer together as well as closer in size. Now you are ready to choose the focal length lens that gives you the image size you need for the perspective you have chosen. In this case we need to eliminate the extraneous matter so let's try a 300 millimeter long lens. If we had a lot of items in the shot and we weren't getting all of them in the shot we'd need a wide angle lens. In all cases we would have to make sure the lens has enough covering power. Covering power, covering power. What does that have to do with what I'm seeing now? See this diagram? It shows that to cover a piece of four by five inch film adequately, a lens must project an image circle of 161 millimeters. Actually, in order to take full advantage of a view camera, the image circle must be considerably larger than the 161 millimeter film diagonal. The larger this difference, the more useful the lens becomes. So an image circle of at least 230 millimeters is suggested. This will be more than adequate to cover most camera movements. Also bear in mind, image circle is controlled by the lens design. Two lenses of the same focal length can have significantly different image circles, depending on the optical design. That's another reason lens selection is so important. The advantage of the view camera is its ability to match the focus plane to the subject plane. Look at the focus now, and watch what happens when you swing the front of the standard to bring the lens more parallel to the plane of strong focus for the speakers. The focus improves dramatically as we become aligned with the plane. Seems awfully simple, but still a little strange. Well, here comes the kicker. If you adjust a view camera so that the planes of the film, lens, and subject all meet at a common point, the subject plane will be in completely sharp focus. You don't need to know the physics, just that it works. And if you want to impress other photographers, this is called the Scheimflug rule. Scheimflug? Yes. Too bad the fellow who discovered it wasn't named Jones, huh? Give me that again. I think Scheimflug's throwing me. Better yet, let me show you how to find the plane of focus on this shot. Start by focusing on two points that are relatively far apart but in line with the general plane of the subject, say the bottom front corners of the two speaker cabinets. Then swing the front standard in the direction of this plane. Focus on the two points again. The focusing distance between the two points has decreased. Continue this process until there is no real difference between the two focus points. And there you are. The subject plane of focus is completely sharp. This might seem time-consuming now, but it'll go very quickly once you get used to it. And that takes us into what really is the unique world of the view camera. Its own world of motion. Swings and tilts, slides, rises, and falls. So, how's it, uh, how's it going here? We're, I mean, I'm ready for you now. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's check and take a shot. Well, Jim, we've got an interesting shot coming up, but uh, first, how much do you really know about the movements of this camera? 
Well, that's not exactly one of my strong points. I can vouch for that. Thanks a lot, pal. Well, mechanically, you need to know the movements the large format camera is capable of and what they're called. Now, you've already used one, the swing. That was when you move the camera lens on its vertical axis to find your plane of focus in that last shot. You also can swing the back standard. Next, the camera also tilts on its standards horizontally, front and back. And finally, the camera shifts when either standard is moving horizontally from the center or neutral position. Remember, all swings, tilts, and shifts start at the neutral or zero position. That's in order to give you a constant frame of reference. Got it. Okay, there are two other movements, both vertical, called rise and fall. Now, to use rise, either the lens board or the back of the camera is raised above the neutral position. Fall is the lowering of the lens board or back below the neutral position. Now, during all of these movements, keep the shutter open and the diaphragm at its widest setting. And don't forget to check focus after each movement. There sure is a lot going on, but what do all these movements have to do with the image? Well, here are the ground rules, and then I'll show you visually. First, the front standard controls the plane of focus. The rear standard, the shape of the image or perspective. Rise, fall, and shift, all lateral movements, alter the position of the image, up, down, or sideways in relationship to the film. You know, maybe I could understand this better if you could demonstrate it in some way. Okay, watch the ground glass. Now, first we'll do lens swings. The image stays the same while the plane of focus changes. Okay, here are the front tilts. Image still the same, but again, the plane of focus changes on the vertical axis. Good. Rear standards now. Remember, the back controls shape. First the tilts. When the back tilts up, the top becomes larger. And when it tilts down, the bottom becomes larger. Good. Swings are next. Talk to me now. When you swing, the right side of the back towards the speaker, the side closest to the subject becomes larger, and vice versa. And in addition, it's possible to control the degree to which lines converge and diverge by swinging or tilting the camera back. Because as the back pivots around its center, one side gets further from the lens than the other. However, you can only control one plane at a time, so you may have to make a decision on which one to concentrate on. Now hold on to that thought while we run through the rises and falls. We're back at the neutral position now and working with lens movement. Now watch. When the lens rises, the image rises. Now remember that image, like all others, is reversed. So the image on your film actually will fall with the front lens rise. Conversely, lens falls, image falls on ground glass. Now when you shift, the image moves right or left. Now on the back, back shift left, image moves right. Back shift right, image moves left. Back rises, image drops. Back falls, image rises. Think you've got it now? You know, it's really all coming together. I can't believe all the things this camera can do. Well, it seems to me you're beginning to get a hole in this thing at that. Let's do that last shot. Okay, Jim, here you go. Just a little more complicated. Now, I've been working a long time setting this up and getting it lighted properly. Now, we've worked in this together, but you handle the camera. Do you really think I'm ready for this? Let's find out. Start with the lens. Now, the perspective we want is close, but we've got a lot of subject to cover. What kind of a lens? Wide-angle lens, I'm sure of that. Right, 90 millimeter. Now, the camera also is higher than the subject, so I want you to tilt the rail and with it, the entire camera down. Okay, then bring everything back to perpendicular by leveling off the front and then the back standard. Okay. Now check the ground glass. What do you want to do now? Well, we've made enough moves that I want to do a rough focus. Go ahead. Next, I want to change the shape. I want to make the tops of the cassettes larger. You got any ideas? Yes, back standard controls shape. So if I want the top larger, I move the top of the film closer to the subject, tilt the back forward. What about the plane of focus and the uh, depth of field? 
Lens standard controls plane of focus, so I need to use the Scheinflug grill. <laughs> I don't believe I remember that name. I first determine a general plane of focus and select two points on that plane, and from them get my actual plane of focus. Then stop the lens down and use a loop to check focus. Now, I've already set the aperture and shutter speed on the lens for you, so what remains? Close the shutter, lock it in place, and take a Polaroid to check composition and exposure. Do it. Well, that's it, or just about it. A lot of work and thought has gone into getting this shot ready. We don't want to blow it now. Go through our checklist one last time before we release that shutter. By the way, not a bad first day in the job. You make a shot. Nice going. Oh, so you're back. Never left, and I haven't heard him so enthused in years. I do feel pretty good, though. Hey, better get the shot. Want me to read the checklist? Sure. And by the way, thanks. Start at neutral or zero position. Got it. Focus. Check. Adjust shape or image with back standard. Got it. Determine subject plane. It's done. Adjust plane of focus. Check. Reposition image back standard. Got it. Focus. Use a loop. It's done. Lock all controls. Determine exposure and set shutter. Hold on a second, would you? Close the lens. Insert film. Got it. Wait and shoot. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis from CBS News. You may have recognized my voice as narrator in this production, but my personal interest in photography goes back many years, even before my journalism career. It's this personal interest, along with Calumet's desire to present sound educational programs promoting photography, that really led me to this project. So on behalf of Calumet, I'd like to express our thanks for watching the program and hope that you have found it not only informative, but that it may provide a spark for that creative energy that keeps us all shooting. Thank you.